Welcome. <laughs> Bienvenidos. <laughs> As Far As Anyone Knows is a mostly Latino history podcast where each week your hosts Minerva Angeles and Fredo B take turns sharing some Latino history, bad jokes, and ancestral love. Welcome to another episode of As Far As Anyone Knows. This is your host Fredo B and Minerva Angeles. And to, on today's show, I'm going to talk about uh, Latino participation in the American Civil War. But before we get into that, Minerva, what's on your mind? Mostly the sadness I feel about having to experience adulthood. And there are many things about adulthood that are sad, but I think for me anyway, the saddest thing is how your body changes. And there's not supposed to be an understanding of it when you're a child. Like, cause I was going to say there's no warning, but there is warning. There's a lot of warning. You see how older people eat yeah. your whole life. You yeah, see yeah, how yeah. older people age your whole life. How many creams your mother put on at night. Right. And just, you just don't think it's going to happen to you. Or you see yourself as young in the perspective of of who you are when you are young. And then that continues to change. And so that has changed differently every time, right? Like you change from a child to an adolescent and then an adolescent to like a young adult. And then I don't know what I am now, but I guess I'm somewhere in between. Um... No, I mean, I'm a full-grown adult. It's terrible. And so I um, hate it here, and I want to be able to digest French fries. <laughs> As a result of my incapacity to digest French fries, I've had to change a lot about my diet, and it's really challenging on me, cutting down carbs, cutting down processed sugars. I grew up eating chips. I think chips are the tastiest thing and a uh, way to cope with life. Anyway, anyone eating chips while you're listening to this, I wish I was you. But I can't be you anymore because I have to eat whole grains and vegetables. And those are yummy too, but those are not chips. Yeah, it's a weird thing as you get older. First of all, I would like to say that I don't I don't see myself as old, but I know I feel it. My body says otherwise, right? When I go up the stairs or like kneel down, my knees pop, my back cracks. It's a it's it's a thing, you know, you look into more comfy shoes nowadays. Um you you're, you're, you got to make sure you have the right pillow to support your neck at night. And I I don't think I've ever s- I didn't see myself getting to this point that that much, as I'll say. But mentally, I'm still y- young. I think we're we're still young, you know, because I'm still mind blown by the fact, you know, when you watch these old movies or TV shows, and you're like, oh, that person is actually my age now, and I thought they were much older <laughs> growing yeah. up. Yeah. Um, so it's just like there's no, you know, like uh. Catherine O'Hara in uh, Home Alone. Uh, She was only 36 when she filmed that movie. And I'm to believe that she had five children, four of which were in their teens. (laughs) I guess, yeah, it's possible. But, you know, compared to our lives now, where, you know, I'm I'm 36, you're in your 30s as well. Um, We have two young children. I can't imagine having a teenager at this point, but... I don't know it happens. Um, it's not a judgment. It's just more along of where I see myself um, and how that, you know, and that totally relates in terms of, you know, what you're talking about in terms of food, because you got to, I guess you got a wake up call from your, your stomach that said, stop eating French fries. It's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that if I could eat something every day that's potato based, 
I would do that. But I, I know that that's no longer who I am. It's just, I think in some reflecting that I've been doing, I've realized that as of late, what I need to do is accept the reality. Um, I keep thinking if I achieve this lifestyle, if I go out for runs more often, if I do what I'm supposed to do, then I will get back to a place where I could digest food or something. But the truth is, like many times in life when we get to certain places, there's there's no going back to what I used to be able to do in the same way that I used to be able to drink and yeah, get over it. Like, what was a hangover? What was that? No, like, listen, I, <laughs> I, I used to be able to go to a party, part, drink, you know, all night and then get home, get dressed and then go to work. That's mm-hmm. not happening nowadays. I, I, if I do that, I'm calling out for a week. I'm taking sick leave. <laughs> like, there's no way. There's just no way. But to your point, not being able to do those things that you once used to do to be in shape. Because I think we used to all have a routine, our our routines, right? Where, you know, like you just said, you would go jogging and you do X, Y, Z. It's a matter of evolving with your body, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And just kind of looking at, well, that might not work for what my body is today. Yeah. What used I mean, to work before is not working today. So, like, now you have to evolve into what else, whatever form it does work for your body. And I think that's the hardest part. And I think that's what we don't talk about when we're talking about dieting and we're talking about all these things. We don't talk about how the body changes and how you're no longer able to do those things. Yeah. But my friends are doing keto um, and I started to do keto with them and they don't know this. So they're. Either I'm going to disclose this information uh, in advance, or this is going to be a really good test as to who's actually listening to this podcast. (laughs) But uh, I stopped doing keto because it is not a really great diet for people with issues digesting like dairy and and A lot of protein and fat. Right, really like fatty meats, like... I I can't have like bacon with cheese melted into it into an egg. Are you crazy? I I was miserable. I did it for a week and I was miserable. I I had no energy. I was like burnt out and I you know I need high fiber stuff. So I am still doing very low carb, but I am definitely getting my nutritious cereal in in the morning that is whole grain because I need a whole grain situation for my stomach to settle and be prepared to intake any kind of food at all including coffee so listen girl uh girls i love you and this is this is a journey we're all gonna be on together but i'm gonna do it with whole grains (laughs) (laughs) yeah i think it's a matter of finding the diet that work or you or you know like you said it's a lifestyle really right you know you realize what your body could intake and what it can't um and yeah i saw you that week of straight keto (laughs) you the most miserable person in the world and by extension like you know being a good partner i was like well i can't have anything fun in the house yeah you still kind of don't have anything fun in the house because i'm making this change and i need it i can't have chips in the house because that that's my downfall that's yeah. my major down. Like that is my my gateway drug is chips. Like because as soon as I <laughs> that's, <laughs> as, your, that's your crack. That's because no, as soon as I have it, then I they're they're not Lay's is not lying when they said you can't have just one. That's very true. Additionally, uh, in addition to it being absolutely delicious, what it does is that it has to be accompanied by something also delicious. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna have chips with water? Come on now. Come on. I mean, who are you, who are you kidding right now? It's so either you, Snapple iced tea or right? Coke. And, and yeah, and me, I have moved away from Coke in my adult life, but but I always move back into it. There, I always go into to there moments. Period, yeah, there's periods. Where periods we're of heavy co- Coke drinkers. <laughs> going back into Coke. And I have to stop because it is, it, 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 Coke is also one of those things that I particular I personally cannot just have one hit of i need 
I'm going to then like be like, oh, well, just another little bit. And then then somehow there are, you know, several two liter bottles in the house. And how are we going to get away from this? And it's a cycle, and I have to get out of it. I'm a so, huge enabler, too. So. <laughs> no, you're just, you don't have the worst all. person, too. So, uh, if you're on a diet and you're around me and you're like, should I have those cheese fries? I will tell you, yes, <laughs> have the cheese fries. It's like, a beautiful know, diet, thing. Fuck the diet. But, but, uh, but in general, fuck diets because what we need to do is move away, and what I'm attempting to do, because I am making no promises, universe, but I am going to try to head into the right direction. What we should be doing is practicing general healthy living and healthy choices. Uh, it's a, It's a lifestyle change so that we're not in this constant back and forth of binging basically binge eating terrible things that are terrible for you and then going back into getting on a diet and so then you deprive yourself of nutrition in your diet because you you know most of these diets are not well balanced and you go kind of go back and forth it's better to just get like educated on what what is healthy to eat but most importantly what is right for your body and then operate that way. That doesn't mean that you... You can't treat yourself. Right. But you should, when you treat yourself, it's with the understanding of this is a one-time thing. The way it's sort of like a reprogramming of your mind of like, this is, I'm indulging in a one-time thing. Um, I thought about it and I was just like, you know, I'm going to start treating that kind of food like I do alcohol. And for me personally, that means something. I know some people, you know, drink a little bit more often. But since I've had kids, I don't really drink as much as I used to. And so I will treat it exactly that way. And I'll I'll eat something that is uh, indulgent sometimes when, if I can. Is it a weekend? What, do I, I'll do the same math I do when I want to drink. Are we at a party? Are we at a party? <laughs> is it appropriate for the setting? I guess I'll do it then. <laughs> I mean, please don't. I mean, you know, if whenever things open up and back up again and we're able to go to a restaurant, don't be that person that's like, actually, is this vegan? So, uh, yeah, I, I'll try not to be the person asking if something is vegan, but that's because we go to restaurants scarcely pre COVID because we have children. Yeah. So, but if I, if we're going to a and restaurant, we don't go to restaurants that are vegan. Exactly. But if we, if we were some, if we turned into somehow the people that go to restaurants weekly, yes, I would ask what options they have that are plant-based because that's what a girl wants. That's what a girl needs. Whatever makes me happy sets me free. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Minerva will keep us updated on her, on her, um, journey through this, uh, I guess, lifestyle change. Um, so, but I want to jump into now the main topic. So it's been a couple of weeks since the attack on the U.S. Capitol by right-wing terrorists that looked stop and overturned the results of a free and fair election. One of the groups identified as leading this insurrection are the Proud Boys, Proud Boys being notable for, during one of the debates, Trump asking them to stand back and stand by. But who are they, right? The Proud Boys were founded in 2016 by Vice Media co-founder Gavin McGinnis and described themselves at the time as a politically incorrect men's club for Western chauvinists. So, I mean, for me, that's coded as just wanting to be straight up wanting to say straight up racist or rude things whenever somebody says like oh we we're just we just want to be politically incorrect that's just code for like i want to be able to say really inappropriate and racist things misogynistic things homophobic things yeah and not get uh flack for it because i'm being politically incorrect you know yeah i don't understand how like people's existence has become political and I think that every time we validate that by calling something PC or politically correct, that we are engaging and we should really move away from that because 
it's not about being politically correct. It's about being respectful about someone's existence. Yeah. So today the group is designated as a hate group by legal advocacy organizations such as the Southern Poverty Law Center, who has been warning of the group's violent tendencies and strong ties to white supremacy for years. For their part, the Proud Boys claim to be an all-inclusive group. In a statement given to USA Today, we don't care what color you are or what your background is. If you love America, we consider you a brother. That's a quote from the current leader of the Proud Boys, who goes by the name of Enrique Dario. Dario rhymes in barrio. So, uh, Enrique is a 36-year-old man from Miami, Florida. He identifies as an Afro-Cuban. He was elected the chairman of the Proud Boys on November 29th, 2018. You know, I'm not sure. I guess they have elections. I'm not really sure how he was selected to be that the sounds, chairman. That sounds like a political move on the Proud Boys end. Uh, yeah. So I, I have to admit, like, you know, in doing the research and learning about this, l- learning that the leader of this alt-right neo-fascist hate group you know, that the leader is a Latino who identifies as an Afro-Cuban at that, it really blew my mind, you know, and it got me to thinking about other parts of history where we, as we, as a collective, we um, may have been on the wrong side of, of things. And I think, you know, to draw parallels to what happened on January 6th, um, to uh, the American Civil War is pretty easy there because, you know, it's again, it's a lot of infighting. It's a lot of people disagreeing about elections. Uh, Really, it's white supremacy. It's about the dominance of white people over black and brown people in this country. Um, And it takes you right back to the Civil War Mm -hmm. because the Civil War was fought over what? Slaves. I know other people will say, actually... Uh, Fredo, it was fought over states' rights. Mm, the states' rights to own slaves. The American Civil War, uh, for those of you who took American history in, in high school um, and were paying attention, may recall that it was fought uh, during the four-year span, uh, five-year, you know, uh, 1861 to 1865, between the northern states and the southern states. Um, The American Civil War was a formative experience for many Americans who lived through it. Hardly anyone escaped being touched by the war in some form or another. Hispanics were no exception. Dear listeners, uh, today I'm going to be using the term Hispanic as opposed to Latino. Uh, Mostly because I will be talking and we'll, we'll talk about it, but mostly because we are going to be including people directly from Spain who immigrated to the United States in this in this narrative. So to be able to include them, I'm going to be using the term Hispanic, which is not a term that I normally use. I normally use Latino, Latinx, Latina, but Hispanics will be the term that I'm using today. Just wanted to clear that up. So just as it did for so many other groups, the war tore apart Hispanic communities as many young men throughout the country had to make a choice remain loyal to their union, or fight for the Confederacy. Uh, Geography was a large factor in their decisions. In the Southeast, a significant number of Hispanics were wealthy planters with reliance on slave labor. So these were mostly Spaniards, Criollos, uh, who inherited this wealth. They've been here for a while, right? So thinking about, remember, Florida used to be a part of Spain until it was annexed by the United States, the Louisiana and all those countries were really more uh, French or French territory until again annexed by the United States. So you have a lot of wealthy Spanish and um, criollos there, mm-hmm. mestizos. We should clarify that a criollo or a creole person in the definition of, you know, in the colonial sense is a person who has Spanish parents from from Spain and was born in the Americas. Exactly. Thank you for that, um, uh, that note and clarity. Um, so we had the Criollos who 
were wealthy uh, landowners. They they relied on slave labor. So Hispanics throughout the Southeast, most notably Louisiana, Alabama, and Florida, would fight for the Confederacy in large numbers, big enough to form entire regiments. Uh, so there were entire regiments of just hi- Hispanic soldiers in the Navy, the U.S. Navy, um, well, the Confederate, Confederate Navy, the uh, Confederate Army. Um, there were whole regiments of just Spanish or Hispanic soldiers. Uh, for the most part, though, like they were integrated into the white regiments. To be clear, like when I'm talking about these people, yes, they're Hispanic, but they're they're white for intents intents and purposes, right? Because mm-hmm. they were accepted into they they were not segregated. Yeah, and then again, and it, they were accepted because there was full knowledge that they were not mixed, right? At this time, they were not being given the um, term mestizo or mulatto. If you are a mestizo uh, under the colonial definition, that means you're mixed with indigenous or Native American people. And if you are a mulatto, that means you are mixed uh, You are mixed with ensla- an enslaved African. Now, just to be very clear, this is you know, with the baseline of, of whiteness, because mixed with means you starting with white, right? So in this case, or under these guidelines, under the guidelines of colonialism, with white European countries being the main colonizer, it was all sort of seen as equal if somebody was from Spain or England, or whatever. So, and, and that has not changed, so that's not something I necessarily need to explain. I might cut that out. Yeah. <laughs> In the North, urban centers such as New York, Boston, and Philadelphia were the homes of large numbers of immigrants from Spain, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, and Mexico, who struggled to, to be accepted by native-born Americans and viewed enlisting in the Union Army as the quickest way to become a fully integrated American citizen. So not that much different, not much has changed. Uh, you know, we still it, see this. Yeah. Now out in the West, you know, Me- Mexican, Mexican Americans were more divided in their loyalties. Remember the Mexican American war and the treaty with Hidalgo, mm-hmm. you know, so Hispanics from California, a free state, mostly served the Union, as did most in the New Mexico Territory. Slavery was banned by the Mexican Republic in 1829, and the climate of the Southwest was unsuitable to agriculture, preventing the institution from taking hold in the region. However, some did join the Confederacy, you know, either because they were so salty toward the American government, uh, you know, the whole Mexican-American war thing, Mm -hmm. stealing their land, or, uh, you know, purely due to proximity to the South. So it's like, well, you know, everybody else is doing it. Might as well join the Confederacy. The most division, however, occurred within the state of Texas. Slavery was prevalent within Texas. In fact, Mexico's abolition of slavery in 1829 had been a key reason for their revolt. Side note, Texas was its own independent republic for a few for, for a while there. So Interesting. until it was annexed again by the United States in the Treaty of Hidalgo. Some Tejanos joined Confederate home guards and militias for the primary reason of not wanting to be sent thousands of miles away to fight in unfamiliar lands. A similar reason prompted some Tejanos to join the Union so they could defend their families and communities from a close proximity. Many Tejanos also joined the Union because of their resentment of white Texans for taking their land. The issue of slavery also affected Tejano's decision. Some Tejanos had grown wealthy and dependent upon enslaved labor like many of their white counterparts, while some poorer Tejanos retained an anti-slavery attitude and even helped runaway slaves escape to Mexico via the Underground Railroad. So that was interesting for me to learn. You know, when you learn about Underground Railroad, you're you're always talking about going north, right? Mm -hmm. But they never talk about going to Mexico. Um, and that makes sense now because, you know, Mexico 
banned slavery in 1829. That was a whole, I don't know how to do math, but like at least 40 years prior to, you know, close to 40 years to prior to the proxim- proclamation, um, emancipation proclamation, the Emancipation Proclamation given by Lincoln. So I want to highlight some of the Hispanic figures that fought in the Civil War. There was a couple of them, but these were the ones that I found most notable or interesting. So we have Federico Fernandez Cavada, Cuban-born. Cavada commanded the 114th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment when it took the field in the Peach Orchard at Gettysburg. Because of his artistic talents, he was assigned to the Hot Air Balloon Unit of the Union Army. The what? Hot Air Balloon Unit. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is what I understand to be a hot air balloon. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the basket and with a the giant balloon. balloon with hot air blowing into it. Yeah. So there was a. Unit. So that was. So they fought from up there or something. So let me explain what he did up there. I would love to. I need to hear this. <laughs> and what his artistic abilities had anything to do with it, right? So from the air, he sketched what he observed of the enemy movements. On April 19th, 1862, Federico sketched enemy positions from his hot air balloon during the Peninsula Campaign in Virginia. Uh, Cavada was captured during the Battle of Gettysburg and sent to Libby Prison in Richmond, Virginia. He was released in 1864 and later published a book entitled Libby Life, Experience of a Prisoner of War in Richmond, Virginia, 1863-1864. Not the greatest of titles of a four book, yeah. If you're asking me, but you know, I'm not a I'm not a published author, so author, so. Well, you know, if you're the type of reader that wants to know exactly, exactly. what the book is about, <laughs> that's the book for you. Uh, so the book detailed the cruel treatment um, he received in the Confederate prison. So the next person is General Diego Archuleta. Uh, he was Chuleta. Member- Archuleta, yeah. That's, that's what's up. Diego Archuleta. Uh, he was a member of the Mexican Army who fought against the United States in the Mexican-American War. During the American Civil War, he served for the United States in the New Mexico, the New Mexico Militia. He fought with the 1st New Mexico Militia Infantry in the Battle of Valverde and became the first Hispanic to reach the military rank of Brigadier General. Um, he was later appointed an Indian agent by President Abraham Lincoln. A what? An Indian agent. So an Indian agent was an, an individual authorized to interact with Native American tribes and First Nation governments on behalf of the United States government. Oh, so he was like a liaison or something? Yeah. Interesting. Um, so... Do we still have those? That's a very good question. Yeah. And if they are, they probably are not called Indian agents. I would hope not. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's a wrong name. Um, but it would be interesting because that seems... I mean, I know that there are some programs and some connections that the government has with Native American groups and reservations. But I would be interested to know if there were still... Um, there was something like that. Yeah, I don't know. I would. I would assume. I would assume. But... You know, can't go assuming these things. So then we have Colonel Santos Benavides. Benavides commanded the 33rd Texas Cavalry Regiment. He was the highest ranking Tejano in the Confederate Army. That So those are the people fighting for slavery. Um, on March 9th, 1864, he defended Laredo against the Union's 1st Texas Cavalry, whose commander was Colonel Edmund Davis. A Florida native who had previously offered Benavides a Union generalship and defeated the Union forces. Probably his greatest contribution to the Confederacy was securing passage of Confederate cotton to Matamoros, Mexico. In 1863, on March 18, 1864, Major Alfred Hull led a force about 200 men from the command of Colonel Davis near Brownsville, Texas, to destroy 5,000 bales of cotton stacked at the San... Agustin Plaza. Colonel Santos commanded 42 men and repelled three Union attacks at the Zacate Creek in what is known as the Battle of Laredo. So, 
uh, this is one of those things where I call bullshit on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Again, you know, it's a weird thing because the Confederate army didn't win the Civil War, yet they still really maintain the narrative of what happened during yeah. the war, right? It's such a strange thing. It's like, uh, it's a weird relationship that white supremacy has with itself. It's sort of, it's kind of like the way liberals are versus, you know, the way conservatives are. And the conversation being that, you know, liberals have, they're like more covert, you know, racism, whereas conservatives will be more overt and more obviously racist so i think in this way it's sort of like it it sort of protects each other so there's an idea of like yeah we won because we know generally that this was like not okay and so we're gonna move away from this um but we'll let you have your stories and look what they've done with their stories yeah you know and i'm gonna i'm gonna say that this is a version of the truth i'm sure that they were the underdog in the fight, that there was less of them than there were of the Union Army. Was it, you know, thousands of them against only 42 men? Uh, you know, It's hard to say. And it's, you know, again, like this is... Or hundreds. We, we, we let them tell their stories. We let them keep their flag. And this is, you know, yeah. this is the journey. I'm sure there's... Uh, I, th- I think, obviously, now we're kind of taking ownership of these stories a little bit more and fact checking a little bit more. But what our recent or most recent government has done with facts is not a new problem. And this is historic. You know, we've seen this time and again with historical documents, which is why, you know, the same when when you and I are researching, we always take it with a grain of salt, or we try to get as many sources as possible to try to verify this particular report of things, because we know that the that the winners always get to tell the story, mm-hmm. and in this case, the losers get to tell the story, and we'd like to know why, <laughs> right? Um, like, in what interest? Yeah. Do we need to hear that? You know what I mean? It sounds like... And I want to be very clear that by all accounts in my research, this is a true story. I'm just saying I call bullshit. Um, Now, this is another parallel that I want to draw in terms of like when, you know, when we learn about what happened to somebody like him, right? So these are people who technically they're traitors, right? So they lost the war. Um, against the United States. They're traitors to the United States. What do you think happened to somebody like Santos Benavides? He's white, right? Yeah. Nothing? Yeah, that's exactly right. (laughs) So, after the American Civil War ended, he resumed his merchant and ranching activities and remained active in politics. He served three terms in the Texas State Legislature from 1879 to 1885. So you have a man who was the highest ranking Hispanic in the Confederate Army in making legislature for the state of Texas. So you have somebody who's pro-slavery, who's a white supremacist. Yeah. You know, making these able he was allowed to do these things yeah instead of like being stripped from you know from his land (laughs) from his businesses uh being banned from from holding public office he was allowed to continue to do all these things yeah well i think is again this is what we see when we talk about like again the way the liberal uh sees things the understanding being that Oh, if we end slavery, like the racism and the problems with this relationship with having enslaved people will have ended. It'll sort of naturally phase out. It'll be fine. Uh, When the truth is, again, you put these people, these same people who were in favor of slavery in power, they're just going to create more problems for former slaves. Yeah, because now they're writing it into law. 
Right. Um, and for the, former enslaved people. Yeah. I apologize for this. No. And I just want to be clear. I'm not picking on Benavides. Uh, you know, this is this happened generally to all people who I, I, they all got a pardon. Anybody who fought in the Confederate Army got a pardon, including the the high ranking generals. It wasn't a matter of like, oh, we're, we're going to hold trials. We're going to no. They were just pardoned. Every single one of them can committed an act of treason. Yeah. Um. So that's why it won't be a surprise to me if. You know, Trump himself is pardoned if all these guys who stormed the Capitol, they're, they're themselves pardoned. It already looks like it's heading that way, right? You know, there's already calls for unification and healing and, you know, really going after these people. You know, God forbid we hold anybody accountable. But uh, that's just my take and where I see things going. And then that's why... I, Part of the reason why I love history because, like, you could th- this stuff is not new. Uh-huh. You know, this stuff has already happened. We already see what what happened. We could see where it's going. Yeah, history repeats itself is not just a saying; it's a fact. Mm-hmm. Like, if you want to know what's going to happen, look for precedent. Look for where it's happened before, so you can tell likely where it's going to happen. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm hopeful. I'm always going to try to be positive. I'm always going to try to. Just to hope for the best, because that's all we can do. But I really, really don't see these people doing the time that they deserve. I don't see them in Guantanamo. I don't. Is Guantanamo still open? I thought they closed it. Oh, girl, I don't know. That's, not, that's <laughs> none of my business, what they did with Guantanamo. All right. So, Minerva... Uh, so far, it's been a sausage fest. It's just been talking about all these dudes. But there are ladies involved. And the most notable ones are uh, Lola Sanchez. Uh, Lola Sanchez was born in Armstrong, Florida. She's of Cuban descent. Um, she became upset when her father was accused of being a Confederate spy by, by the Union forces and sent to prison. So this event angered and inspired her to become a Confederate spy. Uh, the Union Army had occupied her residence in Florida, uh, so basically she she eavesdropped on them because um, they're dumb and they were just talking openly in front of her. <laughs> and she got she got all the deets, all the details of their plan of how they were going to attack, everything. So she was like, "I bet." Yeah, I want to take my father to prison, uh, accusing him of being a spy, which he wasn't. All right, guess who's a spy now? Um, Lola was. Um, and so she, you know, gave this information to the Confederate captain. Uh, and because of the information which she provided, the Confederate soldiers were able to surprise the, U- the Union troops in what became known as the Battle of Horse Landing. And captured the USS Columbine, a Union warship, in the only known incident in U.S. history where a cavalry unit captured and sank an enemy gunboat. Wow. So again, you know, she she wasn't on the right side of history, but I don't think she had a. It doesn't get the sense. I don't get the sense that she got, had a really big stake in in it. She was just like, "Yo, yeah, accuse my father of something that he didn't do." Um, yeah, I mean, it was kind of like a fu. Um... A little selfish, but... And then the next person I want to talk about is Loretta Janetta Velasquez. Um, that's an amazing name. Yeah. Or, as she was known, Lieutenant Harry Buford. Uh, Velasquez was a Cuban woman who masqueraded as a male Confederate soldier during the Civil War. Or was she doing drag or was she trans? She was not trans. She, so the book, the book she wrote about her experiences claims that after her soldiers, her soldier husband's accidental death, she enlisted in the Confederate States Army in 1861. Under his name or? No, she just made up a name. Um, So it sounds like she did, she pulled more of a Mulan than anything else. Nice. Um, 
So she fought at Bull Run, Balls Bluff, and Fort uh, Donaldson, but was discharged when her gender was discovered while in New Orleans. Uh, what was, she, was she in the Confederacy? Or? Confederate. So she was pro-slavery. Woo! And you know, I mean, <laughs> can we just get like, <laughs> can we get a break here? Yeah. Um, so un- undeterred, she enlisted and fought at Shiloh until unmasked once more. Then she became a Confederate spy working in both male and female disguises and as a double agent also reporting to the U.S. Secret Service. Um, so it is worthy to note that a lot of historians have come out and said that they don't fully believe her story. Um, a lot of people are saying, like, she made it up. <laughs> There's no way that this could have happened. Others are saying, mm, she does account some stuff that would be hard um, to say if you weren't there. Um, so... It's not documented that she got it's caught? not clear. It's, it's, so there's nothing to corroborate her there's story? There's no corroboration of her stories. So this is 100% just like a book she wrote? She wrote uh, her memoirs, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So Loretta Janetta Velasquez. I so we'll see. I don't know if I believe her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, you know, looking at the this history and uh, of the Hispanic participation in the American Civil War is interesting for me because, once again, we we are primarily written written out of the narrative, even if we are white privilege. If we have the white privilege, we're still written out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a lot of people, like there were whole regiments of Hispanic um, Americans fighting on both sides of this war. But these are stories that we're not told. Um, Yeah, proper Mexican Americans. Yeah. 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 You know, so going back to what, where this all started in with what took place with the likes of Dario, um, Enrique Dario and his Cuban, Afro-Cuban self. Um, you know, history is gonna, is going back to, to Enrique Dario and his Afro-Cuban self, history will either absolve him or will indict him. My money is on that he, it will indict him. It will not look at him fondly as this, you know, righteous uh, figure. But I could be wrong, you know, because uh, there's a lot of Confederate soldiers, Confederate generals who have been glorified. Um, they've, they've had statues erected for them. People still fight to this day to, to have them honored. So it's always a toss up with these kinds of things, specifically because he's Afro-Cuban. So... You know, he identifies as Afro Cuban. Right, okay. So if he identifies as Afro Cuban, it could go either way, right? It could he's he's remembered because this is the narrative they want to hold up, or he's not remembered because we get swept under the rug for a lot of reasons. They um, use the his his use is mm-hmm. no longer mm-hmm. Or so. I mean, there's three ways, right? And the other way of like he'll be remembered for exactly what he is. A racist, self-loathing person that is unfortunately engaging in not only not healthy and toxic behaviors, but as of late, violent ones. And that could be considered a terrorist group. So that's that on that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And so that's our show for today. Thank you so much for listening. All right. Stay safe, everybody. Ha home. See you soon. Follow us on social media. You can follow our podcast at AFAC pod. That's at a F A A K pod or follow our hosts. Minerva at it's Minerva Angel 
and at Fredo underscore B on Twitter.